Okay, hi everyone, and this is the second topic discussed under game theory subject. And this topic is devoted to sequential games, or more formally, games with sequential moves. As we discussed last time, the key difference between sequential moves games and simultaneous moves games is that sequential moves games are characterized by the absence of strategic uncertainty. This means that all the players know on which nodes they are to make the decision. For instance, you can consider this game. So here we have imperfect information constraint uh, denoted by the dashed line. And this means that player one has no idea whether the second player decides to choose B or A. And analogously, the second player has no idea whether the first player decides to choose X or Y. So they can try to guess, you know, or they can try to use some logical analysis in order to detect this, but <clears throat> they never know for sure. So this is what we call strategic uncertainty. In the second game, player two has perfect information of whether player one chosen why during the first round so player two is to make a decision on this node or whether player one chose x during the first round so the second player is to make a decision at this node so in this sense there is perfect information available for the second player and before we proceed let's make a quick revision of terminology so as you remember um, when you depict the game using extensive form, uh, the first node, I mean initial node to start the game, you know, the first decision to be made during this game is also called root of the game. So each node um, creates at least two branches depending on the number of options available for the player making the decision at the node. Um, and the game was finalized with terminal nodes, which basically just depict the payoffs, uh, which are associated with particular combinations of strategies uh, undertaken by each player. So, for instance, player 1 chooses B, then nature decides about good outcome, and for the first player the payoff is 3, for the second player payoff is 2. We do not include nature as the player, by the way. Okay. So, game tree or extensive four is a common way to depict sequential moves game because then it simplifies your job when detecting the outcome of the game using backward induction or rollback. So I believe it's better to demonstrate based on some example. So consider an example, uh, an example of teenager called Carmen. And Carmen is to decide uh, whether to start smoking or not to start smoking. If she decides not to start, not try smoking at all, uh, then the game is over. However, if she decides to try, then she has a choice between continuing smoking and quitting smoking. So, of course, at this point, it's not a game because there is no second player. Carmen just makes decision for herself, but, you know, it's just some reference point to start. So we can draw this tree. Um, okay, a quick note. Uh, it might be quite a complicated task to assign some numerical values when it comes to payoffs. So here you just follow the same rules which you follow when you analyze ordinal preferences or let's say ordinal utility. So for instance, in this case, you know that 0 is better than minus 1 and you know that 1 is better than 0. Uh, simply based on the numerical values assigned to these payoffs. However, 
you have no idea about strength of this relationship you know when it comes to choosing between this and this option as well as between this and this option you know it's like with temperature let's say so you can say that it's warmer when we have 15 degrees outside than when we have 10 degrees outside but you know it's not possible to say that it's like 1.5 times warmer or anything like this so yeah ordinal scale basically so the logic here is like this if Carmen decides not to try then she gains nothing and she loses nothing and since we need some reference point, we assume that in this case, she just gets zero. Why zero? No idea. You know, just a reference point. However, we know that if she decides to try and then she decides to quit, you know, this outcome would be better than this outcome. Just because in this case, she has a chance to get some new experience, uh, she has an opportunity to prove that she has a strong willpower and so on and so forth. So, yeah. And since quitting smoking is good for her self-esteem, uh, to this outcome we assigned a payoff of plus one. Finally, if she decides to try and then she decides to continue, uh, she gets minus one just because smoking is generally bad for your health, you know. Yeah. So, basically, it's enough. So, obviously, if Carmen is a rational decision maker and she attempts to maximize her payoff, she shall choose try and then she shall choose to quit smoking or basically not continue. Because in this case, she will get plus one, uh, which is superior to all the payoffs associated with the rest of outcomes. However, in reality, things are much more complicated. So, <clears throat> the person who never smoked and the person who smoked for a while, you know, someone who is to make a decision between continuing smoking, sorry, between um, quitting smoking and continuing smoking. So, those two people have different preferences and accordingly, they have different payoff structure. So, due to the fact smoking is addictive, you know, those two players are two different people. That's why we can account for this fact of transforming preferences by introducing future Karen. So, today's Karen is to decide whether to start smoking or not start smoking at all. And future Carmen is to decide whether to keep smoking or quit smoking. And here you have the game. So, if today's Carmen decides not to try smoking analogously to this decision tree, this is the end of the game. So, no one gets anything and the payoff is just 0-0. Zero, zero. However, if she decides to try... Then, future Carmen faces a choice between quitting smoking and keeping smoking. So, if future Carmen decides to quit, she will get some disutility, minus one, because the process of quitting smoking is very painful for someone who is addicted. However, this will give today's Carmen plus one, positive one. So, if future Carmen decides to keep smoking, then... Today's Carmen will get negative one and future Carmen will get positive one. And now let's try to elaborate some logic when analyzing this game. Future Carmen will never ever decide to quit smoking. Because if she quits, she gets negative one. If she keeps, she gets positive one. Obviously, this payoff is better for future Carmen. So, future Carmen will decide to keep smoking. Today's Carmen is the rational player who knows the entire structure of this game and who knows that future Carmen is also a rational player pursuing her best interest. So, today's Carmen thinks, okay, if I do not try, you know, this is the end of the game. If I try, then future Carmen will inevitably decide to keep smoking 
and I will get minus 1. For me, 0 is definitely better than negative 1, so I will decide not to try at all. And here you have the solution depicted. So basically, when you cut off some branch, which, I mean, depicting some decision, which will never be made by the player, uh, this is called pruning. So here we prun and the second note, and we always start with the last player. That's why, by the way, this technique is called rollback or backward induction. So as we discussed, uh, future Carmen will never prefer positive one over negative one. So she will never decide to quit smoking. So here we prun at the second note. Today's Carmen is aware of this fact. So today's Carmen knows that if she tries, her payoff will be minus one. So, you know, she decides not to try. And we hear prun at the first note. So the equilibrium of this game is when today's Carmen decides not try, then future Carmen has no option, you know, to make any decision, and equilibrium payoff is zero zero. Okay, more accurately, payoff in equilibrium is zero zero. Okay, so now you have a chance to practice, so if you would like to do this, you can put this video on hold and try to solve this game. So the story is like this. There are three ladies, Emily, Nina and Talia, who live on the same small street. So on one day they decided why not to have a small beautiful garden, you know, which everyone will enjoy. So the size of the garden will not depend on the number of people contributing to creation of this garden. However, there should be at least two people to contribute in order to have garden. So, from each player's perspective, there are four possible outcomes and four possible payoffs. So, let's analyze it from the perspective of Emily, you know, just for the sake of simplicity. So, Emily would be happy if she does not contribute However, Nina and Talia both contribute. In this case, Emily can enjoy a garden, because we assume it to be a kind of a public good, you know, non-excludable. Uh, however, she has nothing to pay for this. So definitely this is the best outcome. And since we have four outcomes possible, we assign the value of four to this payoff. The second best is when she contributes and one or both of other players, Nina or Talia, do this as well. So in this case, Emily can enjoy a garden. However, Emily also has to bear the cost of creating this garden. So this is good, but not as bad, uh, not as good as having a garden for free. So we assign three to this outcome. Then, she does not contribute and only one or neither of other players contribute. So in this case, there is no garden, but on the other hand, Emily does not have to pay anything for this. So, I mean, the cost is zero, so the payoff is two. Finally, the worst possible outcome is when Emily contributes, however, neither Nina nor Talia decide to do the same. So in this case, there is no garden. However, Emily has to bear some cost and we assign the value of one to this outcome. Again, you just follow the same ordinal scale, you know. It also can be like five, three, two, zero, you know, as long as you have this ordinal preference, it's fine. You know, here we just have these numbers for the sake of simplicity and because it seems to make sense. Okay, so we have to solve this game. And the first step to do this is to depict the game in the extensive form. Basically, draw the game tree. Uh, write down all the possible strategies. 
then we have to solve this game using rollback equilibrium and we have to define the optimal strategy for each player. So you already know how to define the possible strategies because this was discussed during the first lecture. So if you want to practice, put on hold and practice and I will proceed with the solution. So here you have it. So first, <clears throat> Emily decides whether to contribute or not to contribute. <clears throat> um, regardless of decision made by Emily, Nina has to decide whether to contribute or not to contribute. Finally, Talia has to decide whether to contribute or not to contribute. Like here we assume that the sequence is like this. First Emily decides, then Nina decides, and the Talia is the last person to move. So for Emily, there are only two available strategies, which are contribute, C, and not contribute, and C. For Nina, there are four available strategies. So there are two nodes and two options available at each node. So she can contribute whatever Emily decides, you know, or contribute regardless of decision of Emily or always contribute. And this is C, C, always contribute. She can decide to, she can decide not to contribute regardless of the decision made by Emily. And this strategy is denoted as NC, NC, never contribute. She can decide to contribute if Emily contributes and not contribute if Emily does not. Like basically mirror decision made by Emily. So here we have uh, C and C. And please pay attention, those nodes are denoted for the sake of simplicity when we interpret strategies. So basically C and C, uh, sorry, uh, C and C means uh, decide to contribute at node D and decide not to contribute at node C. Oh, sorry. Decide to contribute at node B and decide not to contribute at node C. You know, because you just follow this alphabetic sequence of nodes. Uh, finally, Emily can decide to contribute. Uh, sorry, Nina can decide to contribute if Emily decides not to contribute and she can decide to not to contribute if Emily decides to contribute. You know, basically just reverse the strategy undertaken by Emily in the first round. So here you have all of those strategies listed. For Talia, uh, we have CCC, like always contribute contribute regardless of the decisions made by Emily and Nina. It can be and C and C and C and C, which you read as never contribute. It can be C, C, C and C, like C, C, C and C, which you read as contribute at node D, contribute at node E, contribute at node F, do not contribute at node G, and Analogously, you know, so there are 16 strategies in total. I will not concentrate on each of them. But basically, those are just all the possible combinations of decisions available for Talia. So Talia does not know on which node she's going to be located. But, you know, for anyway, you know, she has to have a strategy, a complete plan of actions. That's why those should be all the possible combinations. Okay, maybe we can do another one, you know, just <clears throat> just in case. So, strategy 15, and C, and C, and C, C. You read it as follows. Do not contribute if you find yourself at node D. Do not contribute if you find yourself at node E. Do not contribute if you find yourself at node F. And contribute if you find yourself at node G. So, when it comes to optimal strategies and rollback equilibrium, let's take a look. 
So we always start with the last player and let's analyze what's gonna happen at no D. So at no D, Talia can choose to contribute and get three or she can choose not to contribute and get four. Obviously four is better than three. So at this note, Talia will choose not to contribute because Talia is the rational player, maximizing her payoff. If Talia finds herself a node E, then she can contribute and get three, or she might not contribute and get two. So obviously three is better than two, so Talia will decide to contribute and we pran this and yeah, basically we cut this branch off and we prawn at this node. If Talia finds herself a node F, so she can decide to contribute and get three. She can decide not to contribute and get two. She is a rational person, so she will decide to contribute and we cut off this branch. We cut this branch off, sorry. If Talia finds herself a node G, she can decide to contribute and get one, or she can decide not to contribute and get two. So two is better than one, that's why she will decide not to contribute. Okay, probably I did not discuss it on the previous slide, but again, here the structure of payoffs is determined just by the combinations of decision made by each player. So if Emily decides to contribute, Nina decides to contribute and Talia decides to contribute, then each of the ladies gets three. So they have a garden they can enjoy, but nevertheless, each of them will contribute to this garden. So it's three, three, four. So if Emily decides to contribute, if Nina decides to contribute, and then Talia decides not to contribute, then for Emily and Nina, payoff is three. So they have a garden to which they have they had to contribute. And Talia gets four because she has a garden for free. So basically you do analogously with the rest of this and that's how we come up with the structure of these payoffs. Okay, so now let's get back to backward induction. So now from Talia we move to Nina. So Nina knows that if she contributes, the payoff will be three, three, four. Nina knows that if she does not contribute, the payoff will be three, four, three. And again, we can tell this based on the decisions made by Talia, you know, because we already cut those branches off. So obviously three, four, three, is preferred over 334 because the second payoff is the payoff uh, assigned to Nina. So 4 is better than 3. Uh, if Nina does not contribute, she will get 4. If she does, she will get 3. So for Nina, the optimal strategy is not to contribute. Let's proceed to this note. So if Nina contributes, then the outcome will be 4, 3, 3, with 3 going to Nina. If Nina does not contribute, the outcome will be 2, 2, 2, with 2 assigned to Nina. So 3 is better than 2, that's why Nina will decide to contribute. Finally, Emily knows that if she contributes, then Nina will decide not to contribute, Talia will decide to contribute and the outcome will be 3, 4, 3, with 3 being assigned to Emily. Emily knows that if she does not contribute, then Talia will contribute, Nina will contribute, and the payoff will be 4, 3, 3, where Nina, sorry, where Emily receives 4. For Emily, 4 is better than 3, that's why Emily will decide not to contribute. And here you have equilibrium path of this game. 
So it's NC, C, C. <clears throat> so we know that for Emily, optimal strategy is not to contribute. For Nina, again, you look at the decisions to be made by Nina at each node. The optimal strategy is to not contribute if Emily contributes and contribute if Emily does not contribute. So it's NC, C. We have it here. For Talia, it's not contribute at node D, contribute at node E, contribute at node F, and not contribute at node G. So it's NC, C, NC. And on the intercept of those strategies, we have the equilibrium path of the game. Okay, I hope it's quite clear, you know, you always start from the last player, then you move to the second or to the first player, depending on how complicated the structure of this game is. So, again, Nina keeps in mind that Talia is the rational player, you know. So, in this case, Talia is perfectly predictable for Nina. Nina knows for sure what Talia will choose depending on the decisions made by Nina. And from this, case, from this perspective, you know, it's possible for Nina to adjust her strategy in such a way to get the maximum payoff. Okay, we will do some other examples in a second. So consider centipede, centipede, yeah, I believe centipede, okay, whatever. Consider this game. So <clears throat> the rules are as follows. Uh, two players are chosen randomly and then they toss a coin in order to figure out who is player A to make the decision first and who is the player B to make the decision at the second player. So, <clears throat> um, as the experimenter, like the host of the game, puts a dime 10 cents on the table. Player A can either take or pass. If player A takes the dime, then the game is over and player A will get 10 cents and player B gets nothing. If A chooses to pass, then the experimenter has to add a dime and now player B has to make the choice between taking 20 cents or passing. So if the player B decides to take, then player B gets 20 cents and player A gets nothing. If player B decides to pass, then Player A has to make choice between getting 30 cents or passing, and so on and so forth. So here we have some limit value, 50 cents, um, and both the players are assumed to know that 50 cents is a limit and there will be no increase after this limit. So again, if you'd like to practice, put this video on hold. Uh, draw this game and solve this using rollback equilibrium, and I am proceeding with the solution. So here you have a game tree. So if player A decides to take, uh, player A gets 10 cents, player B gets nothing. If player A decides to pass, then player B faces a choice between passing and taking. So player B can either take 20 cents or pass. In case player B takes, player A, like the first player, gets nothing, the second player gets 20 cents. If player B decides to pass, then player A can take, in this case, the first player gets 30 cents, and the second player, player B, gets nothing or pass, and so on and so forth. Until we reach the last round, where player A can either take and get 50 cents and player B will get nothing in this case, or player A can pass and the game is over for both the players and both the players get zero. So we can apply the same technique of backward induction in order to solve this game. 
and as usual we start from the last round so here player a chooses between take and getting 50 cents and passing and getting nothing so if player a is a rational player she will always choose to take and the payoff will be 50 zero then player b keeps in mind that if he passes player a will choose take and the payoff for player B will be zero. So player B decides to take and get 40 cents. And so on and so forth. So basically here is the solution. At each round, you know, this branch with passing uh, will be cut off. And for each player, the rational decision is to take. And when you reach the first round, you will see that player A the rational player will just decide to take the dime and the game will be over after the first round. By the way, when this game is played, you know, as some kind of the experiment with real life people, uh, not the perfectly rational players, which we assume when we solve any game, uh, it actually ends after the first round quite rarely. So usually players end it up during the second or the third round, depending on the limit imposed by the experimenter. And I just, you know, mentioned this to say that game theory might be quite a good tool. I mean, prescriptive tool, you know, something you use in order to figure out how rational people would behave or how people should behave. But it's not really good as some positive theory, you know, as some descriptive instrument. So it's not really good uh, for predicting actual behavior of the real life people. So consider another example. Um, like if we have two players, Fred and Barney, and they play a game in which they have to remove matchsticks from a pile. They are to start with 21 matchsticks. Fred is assumed to go first. And on each turn, they can remove either 1, 2, 3 or 4 matchsticks. So basically, 1, 2, 3 or 4 are the strategies available for each player. Strategic actions. Sorry, not strategy. Because strategy is a complete plan of actions. And... Suppose that there are only six matchsticks left and Barney is to make a decision. And the question is, how many matchsticks should Barney move? Again, either one, two, three or four in order to guarantee himself a victory. Okay, so here are the solution. So if Barney takes two matchsticks, then Fred will take four and win. If Barney takes three matchsticks, then Fred will take three and win. If Barney takes four matchsticks, again, Fred takes two and wins. So this is the idea. The player who makes the last move is a winner. However, if Barney takes only one matchstick, then Fred is left with five matchsticks. And then, we know regardless of the decision, Fred makes, Barney will always take the last move in this game. So the answer is Barney has to move only one matchstick. And yeah, and in this game, you always want to leave the other player with five matchsticks because in this case, you know, you will be a winner. Regardless of the number of matchsticks he moves, you will always have a chance to make the last move in this game. Okay, so this was just some example to demonstrate to you backward induction or rollback logic. Consider another example. So, a slave has just been thrown to the lions in the Roman Colosseum. Three lions are chained down in a line uh, where the first lion is closest to the slave, then lion two, and then lion three, like in this sequence. 
Each line's chain is short enough that he can only reach the two players immediately next to him. So basically, Lion 2 can reach Lion 1 and Lion 3. The game proceeds as follows. First, Lion 1 decides whether or not to eat the slave. If Lion 1 decides to eat the slave, then Lion 2 is to make a decision whether or not to eat the first lion. Um, if, like, basically, yeah. If Lion 1 decides not to eat the slave, then the game is over. You know, those two lions are of equal, I don't know, like physical shape, physical capacity. So it's impossible for the second lion to eat the first lion as long as the first lion remains hungry. However, if Lion 1 decides to eat the slave, then he is too heavy and Lion 2 has a perfect opportunity to eat the first lion. And basically here we have this payoff structure. So the best option is to eat and stay alive. Then uh, the second best option associated with the payoff of 3 is to stay alive but go hungry. Uh, the lion will get two if he decides to eat and then he is eaten. And the first possible outcome is when the lion goes hungry and is eaten. So your task is to draw the game tree, uh, try to define the rollback equilibrium and define the optimal strategy for each lion. Again, if you'd like to practice, put this video on hold and do so. However, I will proceed with the solution. So, if the first lion decides not to eat slave, then the game is over. So, all the lions remain hungry, however, neither of them is eaten. So, we have 3-3-3. Three, three, three. So, if the first lion decides to eat the slave, then the second lion has to choose between eating client 1 and not eating client 1. So if the second lion decides not to eat, then the first lion will get 4. So he has eaten the slave, however he remains alive. And the rest of lions will remain alive yet hungry. So 4 goes to the first lion, 3 to the second lion, and 3 goes to the third lion. However, if the second lion decides to eat the first lion, then the third lion had the choice between eating the second lion and not eating the second lion. So if he eats, then the first lion is eaten because, you know... This is what happened in the previous round. The second lion is eaten because this is follows this decision made by the third lion. And the third lion is full yet alive. So it's two, two, four. First two lions are full but they are not alive anymore. And the third lion is full yet alive. And finally, if the third lion decides not to eat the second lion, then the first lion is still full yet eaten, because again, this is what happened in the previous note. Uh, the second lion is full and alive, and the third lion is hungry and alive. So two, four, three. And now we can try to solve this. So we always start with the last note, and here the third lion will definitely prefer to eat the second lion, because in this case he will get 4 instead of 3. So we cut this branch off, and we know that for the third lion, optimal strategy is to eat the second lion. For the second lion, he knows that if he does not eat the first lion, he will remain alive and get 3. And if he decides to eat the first lion, he will be eaten by the third lion and get two. Obviously, three is better than two, so the second lion would prefer to remain hungry yet stay alive. That's why we cut this branch off 
and we know that the second lion will decide not to choose to eat the first lion. Finally, here we proceed to the first lion. So he knows that if he does not eat the slave, he will get three. However, if he eats the slave, the second lion will never ever choose to eat him. Because if the second lion decides to eat the first lion, then the third lion will eat the second lion. And second lion is definitely not satisfied with this option. So the first lion keeps in mind that the second lion will never ever eat him. That's why the first lion would eat the slave. And in equilibrium we have it as follows. So lion 1 decides to eat the slave. Then the second lion decides, do not to, decides not to eat the first lion. As the result, the first lion is full and alive. So we have four. The second lion is hungry and alive. He gets three. And third lion is also alive, yet hungry, and he also gets three. So like... This is the idea of this game. And here definitely we see first mover advantage. Because Lion 1 have, you know, a privilege to eat the slave just because he knows that if the second lion decides to eat him, I mean to eat the first lion, the second lion will be eaten as well. And the second lion definitely does not prefer this option. So, yeah, here we have it. So, final example. Uh, we consider a rivalry between Airbus and Boeing to develop a new commercial jet aircraft. We suppose that Boeing is ahead in the development process and Airbus is considering whether to enter the competition. So, if Airbus decides to stay out, uh, it earns zero profit and Boeing enjoys a monopoly and earns 1 billion profit. If Airbus decides to enter and develop the rival airplane, then Boeing has to decide whether to accommodate Airbus peacefully or to wage a price war. In the event of peaceful competition, each firm will make a profit of 300 million, and if there is a price war, each firm will lose 100 million. So your task is to depict this game and to find the rollback equilibrium. Again, if you'd like to practice, put video on hold, I am proceeding. So first, Airbus is to make a decision of whether to stay out of competition. In this case, Airbus gets zero and Boeing gets one billion or basically 1000 million. Or Airbus can decide to enter the competition. If it does, Boeing has to choose between peace or war. In case of peace, it's 3 million per each firm. In case of war, each firm will lose 100 million. So, we start with the last note. Here, uh, Boeing will definitely prefer peace, you know, because it's associated with 300 profit uh, instead of 100 loss. That's why Boeing will choose peace, and keeping this in mind, Airbus will decide to enter the competition. And here we have equilibrium path, in and peace. So the idea is like this, here Airbus knows that it makes no sense for Boeing as for a rational player to initiate price war, you know. So in this case, Boeing will lose 100 and at the rational firm, it will definitely prefer to gain 300. So then Airbus knows that if it enters the market, the payoff for Airbus will be 300. It's better than zero, so that's why Airbus will prefer to enter the market. Okay. Oh, sorry. So this was it for this lecture. Next time we're going to discuss simultaneous moves games. And yeah, thank you for your attention.